Reading, readings taken from Philippians 1, verses 27 to 30. My right. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Praise. Thank you, uh, William. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts and lives be now and always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. That's a challenging uh, piece of scripture that uh, William's just read to us. And I know because I can see that it's just coming up to half past 11 and you guys want to get home for lunch or at least you can go and enjoy the sunshine. I'm going to jump straight in if that's all right. So we're continuing in our sermon series this morning on Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. And this passage of scripture, that one verse that hit home for me is an enormous challenge at the beginning of that reading that William's just read. It says, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And as I've been praying about what I should share with you this morning, recognition of, recognizing that the clock is against me this morning, I thought there are hours and hours and hours of preaching that I could preach just on that one particular uh, line. But there are three words that jump out to me from what uh, that scripture says. And the first word is the word only. Have you spotted it? The word only. In that, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Have you spotted the word only? It's not there, is it? Well, it's not in the, the NIV. But I'm informed by biblical scholars that it's there in the original. What Paul wants to say to the church at Philippi is, only, only live a life worthy of the gospel. Only live a life. And Paul, when he's writing to the church in prison, says that whether he lives or whether he dies, there is only one thing that he wants them to know, and there's only one thing that you can do as a believer, and that's to live your life uh, in a worthy manner of the gospel. I did think, just as a side note, because I put it into my script, that would be tough for any preacher to be able to say just one thing in a sermon. And you might have thought, because of the time, you're only going to get one thing. You're probably going to get 11 this morning. The second word that jumps out to me in that uh, piece of scripture passage, it's on there. It is actually in, on, on only. It's on there. In, that's the, the ESV version of the scripture, but it's not in the NIV. The second word that jumps out is the word worthy. Worthy. To live a life worthy of the gospel means to live a life that gives proper weight to remembering that all that God has done for you. The message version of this uh, particular scripture says, live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. Live in a way that means that you are a credit to the message of Christ. The third word, conduct. Now we don't like the word conduct, do we? It speaks of things like discipline. But actually what Paul is trying to say here is that we're to conduct our lives 
as if we are citizens of heaven. Conduct our lives as if we are citizens of heaven. And indeed, we are citizens of heaven if we have said yes to believing in Jesus. There is a, a question that many a preacher will say to you that says that if you were to be arrested for being a citizen of heaven, would there be enough evidence to convict you? True Christianity lives in a way that never denies their true identity. As we've just sang this morning, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. There is no middle ground for the Christian, and neither should there be. But if you look at those three words that I've just said, the word conduct, the word only, and the word worthy, there are implications for us as believers. I've got three implications. There are many more, I'm sure, but there are three implications. The firstly is that our salvation, that that Jesus has done on the cross, must be real in the way in which we live it out. Not when we live it out in here on a Sunday morning and we put our hands in the right places and we clap our hands in the right places, but actually we live out that salvation for the rest of the week. How's your Easter going? How's your Easter going? For many people, they would say, Easter is now over. You look in any of the shops, the Easter eggs have gone. But for us as the church, for us as believers, we proclaimed just a fortnight ago when I did Baby Shark, remember it? Some of you remember it? We said, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. So I ask you, we're in this season of Easter. How is it going, seeking to walk out, live out that Easter faith that you proclaimed loudly just a fortnight ago? Has God given you opportunity yet to speak out? Are you using that opportunity? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, how many of you have even asked him, given it a second thought since you walked out of church here on Easter Day? But there are implications. Our salvation must be real in the way that we live it out. The second implication is that unbelievers will look at Jesus and draw their own conclusions on what it means to follow Jesus by the way that they look at our lives. People really are looking. Yes, they are. I said it on my script. On Friday morning... I snuck into the teaching at Spring Harvest in Minehead. I did not go down to Minehead, but I snuck in online. There was a secret way. I was saying to Amy that there was a secret way for those that weren't at Spring Harvest, that were at Skegness. If you knew how to find it, you could watch the teaching in Minehead. And on Friday morning, I was watching the teaching, and I was uh, listening to the Young Preacher of the Year Award at Minehead. There was one at Skegness, a 13-year-old boy who stood up and preached to 2,000 people. Those that were there, Matt, I think you might have seen this. I watched the preacher at Minehead on Friday morning, and she was a 17-year-old girl called Jemima. And she was absolutely fantastic. And one of the things that she said in her preach was this line that jumped out to me. We're going to go to the second slide. Be careful how you live. You will, only, you will be the only Bible that some people read. Be careful how you live. You will be the only Bible that some people read. That's a, a quote that's been used by many a preacher but it's attributed to a guy called William Thorne. So I want to ask you this morning, church, what story are you telling? If you are the only Bible that some people will read. Thirdly, 
We live, don't we, in an increasingly secular age. And because of that, what we do as believers has a huge impact. What's the phrase? Every, everything helps, everything matters. The things that we think that are insignificant as believers is actually significant if we are called to live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's why I want to just share those three things with you this morning. They're not just merely important that we need to be passively aware of, but something that we need to remember as believers on a day-by-day basis as we set off out of our house to go and be an ambassador for Christ. Society is increasingly hostile to the church, but as I'm going to jump into in a minute, that shouldn't stop us seeking to live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. When people look at the church and us, they see our mudslinging. We are very good as believers at mudslinging. We mudsling between ourselves. We mudsling between other believers. We say, well, we're not like the Anglicans. Or we're not like the Methodists. We sling mud and the world sees that. They see the mud slinging. So I go back to that quote. Let's just go back to it. From William Thor. Be careful how you live. You will be the only Bible some people ever read. Church, family, I'm not accusing anybody, but when the world sees the church mudslinging, we've got to stop. And it's not something that's going to happen across the whole church unless we as individuals say it starts with us first. When Paul was writing the passage of scripture that we're exploring this morning, he had absolutely no idea whether he would get out of jail in Rome. He worked on the assumption that he would never visit the people of Philippi, to whom he's writing this love letter that we've talked about before, again. And so the one thing he wants to say to the church at Philippi is live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And there are three ways that you can do that. The firstly, I'm into point three. I said there's about 11. I'm into point three of the main preach. Paul says that we're to stand without division. He actually says in verse 27, stand firm in one spirit. I love the phrase, stand firm. What would it be like if we, the church, stopped the mudslinging between ourselves as churches, between ourselves as individuals, and actually stood together in one spirit? We're going to celebrate Pentecost in a few weeks' time, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon those first believers. And it says that the Holy Spirit fell in Acts chapter 2 because the believers were together in one accord. I thought that this is a bit of an analogy about like a coach saying to the players, if we win together, we win together. If we lose together, We lose together because we are not divided. Uh, But let's be honest, friends. There are trivial things that divide us when they simply should not do. We spend too much time squabbling over issues that don't really matter when all is said and done, simply to prove that we are right. Actually, the thing that we should be united, and I'm going to come to this in a minute, is about standing firm and talking about what God 
through Jesus has done in our life. That is what unites us. So we need to put all the other secondary things to one side. Jesus said, did he not, to his disciples on the night before he was, uh, before he was handed over in John chapter 13, by this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have what? Love one for another. It was a joy to sing this morning. Let there be love shared among us. Because, it, yes, it's an old chorus of the 1980s, but actually if we believe it, then we can start living by it. Let there be love. I mean, who wants to be part of a church that's divided either as a fellowship or part of the wider body of Christ that's divided on things. Quite often as Christians we say things, don't we, like, God loves you. But actually what the world hears is, yeah, but, yeah, but God loves you. But actually as believers we actually hate each other. And then we wonder why people don't want to be part of the church. So we need to stand united together. We need to, secondly, strive without compromise. Standing together in unity, but without compromise. In the second part of that verse 27, Paul says about contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Two words jump out there. The word contend and the gospel. The word contend, according to the dictionary definition, is about and like being athletic, contending, persevering, going for it. Are we contending for the true gospel to go out into our streets? onto our communities, into our nation. Are we that exercise? We've been thinking at Spring Harvest this year about what does it mean to be up and alive. And that involves us being contending for the gospel, or rather the faith is what he says. He says, contend as one man for the faith of the gospel. Now, lots of people say lots of things about what the term faith means. It means just feeling nice, some people say. But actually, for us as believers, we're to contend for the faith of the gospel, which is very, very different than just having nice feelings. We're to reflect upon who God is, what Jesus has done for us, how we are called to be up and alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. That even when we sin, God can do a, re a restorative work in us. He can redeem us. We can have salvation forever. And so Paul is saying to the church in Philippi and to us, we need to be united in what we say is the gospel, united hand in hand in hand. So that every person may know that they can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. And that is the faith that we need to believe in. That's the faith that we need to strive for when we conduct ourselves worthy of the promises of God. That's the, what, that's the faith that we need to not compromise over. That is the faith that is the basis of all our unity. It's not whether we like each other or whether we'd be socially together or outside of a Sunday meeting. We need to have a basis of unity that is focused on the uncompromising word of the gospel. And we need to take that message out to go. This has been described by one biblical commentator as aggressive Christianity. And I think he's right. Now, some of you might be going, I don't like the thought of that aggressive Christianity. But friends, let me say this to you. Quite often, the church has been in retreat 
rather than an advanced mode, believing what we proclaim, what we sing about. Too many believers, sadly, and that's why you're hearing messages again and again and again, whether it be on your Christian media or whether it be in your Bible study notes at the moment, there is a sense that we need to say to the church as leaders, stop feeling intimidated. Do not come off the battlefield because of the enemy. We're going to sing in a little while. The battle belongs to the Lord, and indeed it does. But God's word says again and again and again, we must be a church that go onto the battlefield, but we have to go onto the battlefield. I don't see, as I read my Bible, somebody come and tell me after church if they see something different. I don't see God ever telling his people to sit back and chillax. Jesus says, after the resurrection, go and preach the gospel. He says, uh, at the Great Commission, before he goes up to heaven, he says, go and make disciples. And indeed, the first two letters of the word gospel start with G-O, which spells go. I love the quote from a famous Methodist evangelist, whose name I'm not going to mention because it matters not. But he says that the early Christians didn't wring their hands in despair thinking, oh, no, I don't want to go out into the world. But instead, they had great delight as they declared, I'm off into the world. I'm going to tackle something, because I do want to tackle it. I could stop here now, but I want to tackle one more point, if you will indulge me for just a few more minutes. Because it is important to say that if we are to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received, then it isn't easy. And I do want to address that this morning, because it's really easy to hear just the word go without the acknowledgement of the struggle. It has never been easy to be a Christian we have this view sometimes that there is this golden age when it was easy to be a Christian. It hasn't never been that. But I want to say that I get excited when I see people getting excited about Jesus and they just simply can't keep quiet about the gospel. I am excited. But we are to speak united. We're to speak without compromise. But we're also to speak without fear and this is the final thing I want to to talk to you about this morning and I've only got a few pages so you'll be fine but it says in Philippians chapter 1 verse 28 without being afraid in any way by those who oppose you this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed but that you will be saved and that and that by, and that by God it's a sobering reminder to read those words, to understand the reality of those words. Paul does not sugarcoat the truth. He tells the early believers, you are going to be opposed. But what? Speak up anyway. There are people who are not going to like your message, but don't let that stop you. Sooner or later, anybody who is living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ, you are going to run into opposition. Now, many of you have been and had that opposition before. Some of you haven't had it for a while. But Jesus says to the church and to us as individuals, keep speaking Jesus. Keep preaching Jesus. Jesus said in that prayer, on the night before he died, he said, if they hate me, if they hate you, it's because they hated me first. And what happened to Jesus? He was crucified. Leon Evans, who was the preaching, uh, who was the preaching leader for Friday morning in Minehead, said this, it's okay for people to hate you because of Jesus. 
but it's not okay for people to hate Jesus because of you. Say that again. It's okay for people to hate you because of Jesus, but it's not okay for people to hate Jesus because of you. That is uncomfortable, but it is true. That's what verse 28 of this passage is getting at. Genuine believers, those that are living their life worthy of the gospel of Christ, are proved by the quality of their opposition. So let me say to you, if you're not feeling some kind of spiritual attack at the moment, then maybe it's because you're not living a life that is fully worthy. Now that is uncomfortable to say. But all of us who are on the front line are under attack at this moment in time. But the devil is wanting to say to the church, are you giving up? Are you going home? Or are you staying on the battleground? Are you, this morning, living a life worthy of the calling that you have received? The one thing, the one thing that Paul tells the believers that is the heart of this is that we are a citizen of heaven. Despite all of this, despite some of our problems with our unity, despite the fact that we let God down and we compromise at times, Despite the fact that sometimes we don't speak because we are fearful. But we, church, we here in Cotton End, we here to the communities of Wilstead, New Cardington, to the places where we are, can impact the world. If we stand together without division, if we strive to speak the gospel without compromise and speak it without fear. I'm going to stop there. But my prayer for each of us is that God would speak to each one of us this morning about where we're at truly, about what it means to live a life worthy. And if we need to make course correction changes, my prayer is that God would do it if we put out our hands and say, actually, the battle only belongs to him. So before we sing again, I just want to pray for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word that offers to us great challenge. That we, the church throughout the ages, have needed to live a life worthy of the calling of the gospel of Christ. And that is true for us today. Father, help us. Know that you are with us by the power of your Holy Spirit as we seek to grapple day by day by day by what it means to do that. Help us to stand against any division. If there be any division in this church or in this fellowship, may it be rooted out and be said, be gone, so that we can stand united as we seek to take the message of the gospel out into Cotton End, into Shortstown into New Cardington, into Wilsted, into the places where you, where you place us. May we seek, Father, to strive to not compromise on that that we believe. Help us have a story that tells people about what you've done in our life. May that come off our lips so that when people start to say, yeah, but, we can say that we've just got the story of what you've done and that's undeniable, that's uncompromisable. Father, as we go out this week, if we're having difficult conversations about our faith, because we pray, Father, that you indeed would give us opportunities this week to share our faith, help us to do so without fear, so that this week we can truly again at least try, Father, to live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And all God's saints said, Amen. We're going to sing. The battle belongs to the Lord. I will.